Okay, everybody, it is Thursday, and you know what that means. It's TV time. Yeah, Lon Harris is with us to do this week in streaming to break down. We crashed episode four and the dropout episode six. There will be some spoilers, uh, but these were real world stories, so you probably know what we're going to talk about anyway. It's true. Get up on, get caught up on episode seven if you haven't already. It's a great discussion Ooh. about what we're realizing is two really great pieces of television. Great stories, great TV, well executed, just mm -hmm. absolutely fabulous. And then... Uh, we have David Rodolitz on. He is the CEO and co-founder of Fly Fish Club in New York. He's partners with Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk on that. It's New York City's first NFT restaurant. You buy an NFT, you get a membership. You can sell those memberships on uh, NFT platforms. Really fascinating idea. It really is. It's a very interesting conversation. It's going to be a great show. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by... Odoo is a fully customizable and fully integrated suite of business apps that lets you build and scale your stack as you build and scale your business. Your first app is free forever. And right now, Odoo is offering $1,000 off your first implementation pack at odoo.com slash twist. That's O-D-O-O dot -O -O slash twist. Open phone. As a startup founder, a lot of mistakes are easy to roll back but using your personal cell phone number as your company number isn't one of them. OpenPhone makes it easy to get business phone numbers for you and your team, right on top of your existing devices. Visit openphone.co slash twist to get 20% off your first six months. And gun.io, the simplest way for anyone to hire world-class developers expertly vetted for you by senior engineers. Get $250 off your first hire at gun.io slash twist. Okay, everybody. Lon Harris is back I'm to here, talk back. streaming. Everybody's new favorite segment, the part where we watch TV for work, which you get <laughs> yeah. to do every day. <laughs> it's literally right. my job. Literally it your really job. Is your job. Literally uh, my job. Getting paid to watch TV to watch. and movies. Well, Pretty great. I don't get paid. It's like I get paid for the writing that I do about. I yes. don't Nobody's paying me to just like watch tv but it's part of it I have as like a long time tech reviewer it's true like i didn't get paid to just goof off with phones right and you know like they say that like, like but you kind of sort of did there has okay. to be some rigor but you kind of sort of do <laughs> I mean, that's all right but let's see us. so we crashed and the dropout because we have booted super pumped thank god from our uh watching lineups we get it. I, I haven't even thought about it but i'm i'm, I'm in severance uh, and uh, an issue into severance and i'm going i'm going into episode two so we'll do severance after this but i think we should do yeah. severance as uh as a one episode just recapping the whole season which sure. will be in two well, weeks well, there's only two smart. left so, two left, right. we're, so we'll we're do it almost, as a package yeah we're almost yeah. we're almost at the end of season one of Severance. but all right so just to recap more. with uh we crash which is on apple tv plus we're now four episodes in. The last episode was Summer Camp, where right. we saw, you know, Rebecca Paltrow uh, by Anne Hathaway, Rebecca Paltrow, Newman, kind of coming to her own, I would say, in a way. Uh, and then episode four, we're basically teed up with Adam Newman being quite mercurial, running out of money. And the dr I guess the beat is the VCs aren't putting any more money in and they kind of in an offhanded comment say like, you know, we're not Masayoshi-san or something, which lights up Jared uh, Leto's Adam Newman to, oh, right, there's the next person who'll be the bag holder. Mm -hmm. Let, where is he? He's in India, and he's going to go on a flight to India. What did you think of the episode, uh, Molly and Lon? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, they really yeah. did one thing I thought was very clever, which is the constantly interrupting with their spend, like how much yes. they're losing per m week or day. month, uh, day, day, whatever yes. it is. Uh, and that, I mean, you know, the, it's the old Hollywood, like a ticking clock. Like it, 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 if you let, let the audience know there's an hour, the, the characters have an hour to figure this out. It lights a fire under it. The whole thing becomes more compelling because we know that we're working against a deadline. Uh, and I thought that was very cleverly used in this one to like, we're kind of keyed into Adam's emotional state based on the spend. The higher it is, the more trouble he's in, the more manic energy and, uh, and runway. I, I, He's got right. a limited amount of runway mm -hmm. in startup terms, and it's it's a perfect device. Yeah, and it, and it and it works. I think they really use it to to their benefit in this to just keep that keep that you know it, it keeps moving. This, this episode almost reminded me. It's got like a Scorsese movie or a you know the Safdie brothers. They mm -hmm. did uh, Uncut Gems with the Uncut Gems. Uh, I mean, Uncut, Uncut Gems. Gems. Yes. 
They did uncut jams, and uh, it's a masterpiece that I do say so uh, myself. Kind of they, the Julia Fox is their muse, and uh, it, but it, it, uh, their movies have that relentless. It's it's like an anxiety attack on film, yes. and and I think mm-hmm. that they really capture that well, and it puts you into as as much as we're kind of mocking Adam Newman, or or if not mocking, at least you know looking at him with a critical eye. Uh, I think this really helped to kind of put you in his mindset as well of like, yeah. he's up against it. He's got, you know, he's bleeding this money. He knows he has to think big or it's over. Uh, he doesn't really. And I, 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 that's another thing I liked about, uh, you know, the, the show. And they're really driving home that idea that it's not, it's not we work as a concept that he's selling. It's this vibe. It's this, it's this aesthetic yes. idea. Yeah. It's this bustling fun with the you know, modern workspace. And so he knows he's got to keep the momentum going or it's over. And I think that you really get into that mindset in this episode. And just like side note again on the acting. Mm. I mean, Jared Leto is phenomenal. Just full stop. He's phenomenal. Like it is yeah. mesmerizing. And I will tell you, like, I'm a little weird about, I, I know they're doing a great job of humanizing this story and humanizing the relationship and, you know, him and Rebecca and her kind of like, figure trying to figure out who she is and being neglected i like don't care about that i'm i'm such a i don't care about the feelings i love Mm -hmm. the sort of mechanics of this show and if were we not talking about it i would probably get bored by the kind of like rom-com factor but every time he is on screen being utterly insane and manipulative (laughs) and selling you know whether you want to buy it or not like Mm -hmm. i am here for it And, and I think they do a good job also of thinking about how strategic premeditated he is. So yeah. while, you know, it, it, he has a plan, this idea that he was like a non participant, and this got out of control, you're kind of like, maybe not, he seriously is a momentum player. And he's like, listen, if they don't want to give us the lease, then take them out for, you know, lobster, make it fun. We sell the lifestyle. We sell the vibe. How would you feel about a bigger lease? How would you feel about a longer lease? And they're kind of tipping into unit economics. So they're kind of showing us like, okay, he's doing things to win these deals, to change the industry that probably are not going to be sustainable, but he's still got that momentum and winning. And when they're like, hey, there is somebody who actually will give you the ability to spend this money and go crazy. His name is Mashiyoshi san and he likes big bets and you're willing to play into his worldview, amazing. And then he figures out, oh, SAS. They explain this so perfectly. Oh, so it's good. one of the things I love about mm-hmm. the show is he's like, oh, SAS, it's software. It's not hardware. We're selling software. It's an operating system for your life. All this bullshit. Mm-hmm. You're like, wow, he <laughs> yeah. really kind of space as when he just is like deliberately, we're gonna become a tech company so that we can get yeah. this money. Cause that was the question every journalist was asking is right. why is this real estate company a tech company? And then they perfectly answer it, which is like, oh, so they can get Masa's money. Oh, okay. Exactly. Yeah, that's, they, they were literally what leading we all the witness. suspected. There's yep. something clever that the Cohen brothers do a lot in their dialogue, which is they show somebody hearing something and then it wiggles into their brain and then they start saying it like it's a thing that they thought. Like in the Big Lebowski, uh-huh. he sees the TV where uh, George H.W. Bush is like, this aggression will not stand. And then an hour later in the movie, the dude says this aggression will mm-hmm. not stand. Uh, the same kind of thing in this. He hears that tidbit of in New York real estate. It's not about what you can see. It's about who can see you. And it just yes. sticks in there. It's like, oh, that's a smart sounding thing. Someone said to me once. And then at the perfect moment when he's doing the pitch and they're like, you notice we got a WeWork right across the street. Well, it's not what you can see. It's who can see you. And there is a genius to that. Like he's repeated. Yes. It's not an original thought that he had, but no. to hang on to it and to know this is a good line and I'm going to use it at the exact right moment in my pitch is like, well, there is a cleverness to that. And that that is that salesmanship. And like, that's what he was doing. And every time you want to laugh at him, like every time he seems like just a cartoon, right? A moment like that hits and you're like, no, he's a goddamn genius. And that's I think it is as much as I can't uh, believe that I'm about to say this, like, I think it's a real credit to Jared Leto's performance in this that he's capable of getting to the big zany moment. But he's not it's not over the top all the time. It's not a cartoonish performance. He's also yeah. keeping it, lay, you know, a little grounded. There is something to playing somebody who's this mercurial, this 
you know, larger than life and not playing it larger than life. Like it's, it feels like this is a real character in the world. And he's not over the top, even though he is over the top. I don't, I don't know if I'm explaining it correctly, but I guess in acting, there's some restraint that goes on here. And he's showing some restraint while just getting right to that line of being uh, insane. Like when he uses his dad in his pitch, mm -hmm, you know, right. And you start to see like, oh, wow, he's this guy is really playing next level chess. Yeah, he is. He knows Masayoshi San is going to be there. And he says that line. And somebody says, who's that? And he says, my my audience. Yeah, or something. Well, he audience. comes over after the speech and he yeah. says, I really enjoyed that. Maybe I'll come by and see we work and then walks yeah. away. And the guy goes, who was that? And he goes, that was my audience. Right. Like that yeah. was like, wow, he went around the world, uses his dad as like a prop. Yeah. And j and there's thousands of people there. And he gives this incredible speech. And you realize it's like a speech for one. And you literally one person find yourself you thinking, check. you know, a as excessive as we've said many times on the show, as excessive as this whole thing was as like bonkers and maybe terrible idea and bad investment and da, da 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 you still find yourself thinking like man would I, I what am i doing like this guy will go to any lengths and that is portrayed so well that you find yourself being like do i have any hustle at all because damn <laughs> i mean i think that's what we're in this interesting cultural moment where i was saying too about this i think it was the last we work episode where they were playing like naked and famous and they were at the silent disco and yeah. We're we're just now because we're ten years removed from it. This really this moment with dropout and we crashed and all these kind of starter shows. It feels like we're taking our first real analytical cultural look back at like millennial hustle culture. Like this was a whole time. This was yeah. a movement. Like we can now with a little distance look back on it and be like that was a thing that happened culturally around you know late aughts, early teens. Of this idea of like every, you know, young, younger person was becoming this like professional with the laptop bag and working 16 hour days and code, learn to code and all that rise stuff. Rise and grind. Yeah, rise and grind. And, and, and so that's what I feel like this moment is with all these shows. It's like we're yeah. looking back and for the first time we're kind of being like, okay, there were some, there were some positive aspects to this, but also like, wow, mm. like we weren't really interrogating this mindset at the time. Listen, when you start scaling quickly, your company needs to be run professionally and Odoo is the software that helps you maintain control of your fast running business. Odoo suite of business apps lets you run your entire company on one platform. This means you don't need to keep adding a bunch of different SaaS products and paying for them and logins and data. Everything you need is already in Odoo. All you have to do is turn it on when you're ready. Odoo has over 40 main apps and over 16,000 apps from their open source community. You know, stuff like sales, accounting, marketing automation, HR, website builders, and so much more. Plus, if you only need two or three apps to optimize your workflow, well, that's all you're going to pay for. Again, Odoo helps you streamline by running all your business apps on one platform. No more issues transferring data back and forth, and you'll have one customer support contact across all of your apps, not 20. So everything's going to run easier, and it's going to be more affordable. Your first app, always free. And Odoo is offering right now a $1,000 credit on your first implementation pack. Well done, Odoo. Just go to odoo.com slash twist to get that $1,000 off. That's O-D-O-O dot -O com slash twist. I love these $1,000 offers. Well done, Odoo. Well, and talk about the journalism, the credulity of journalism right. is put on display here. I mean, how he just is like call wired and offer them an exclusive look at the WeWork labs. Right. And then it's like, ba boom, cover story. Right. Uh, it's a little embarrassing in retrospect to watch like, God. wow. Yeah. I'm yeah not, I, mean, I, I see in the comments. They're like, well, hustle culture is like, well, I'm not saying it went away. I'm just saying this was like the birth of it as like a movement as like a, an immediately identifiable thing where you could like look at an image of a person yeah. and be mm -hmm. like i know exactly who that dude is and what he's all about well and I, I think there was startup culture right and entrepreneurial culture and then there became larger than life characters uh bill gates and steve jobs and i forgot what the name of that tech giant series was but do you remember that one that had um the 90s like heartthrobs in it what was the name of the there was a series with like 80s Brat Pack playing Bill Gates. Uh, oh, Steve Jobs yeah, yeah, series. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Oh, uh, God, what was that called? I, uh, I do remember it'll that. It'll come to me in a moment. Pirates of Silicon Valley. There you 1999 go. 1999 yes. TV right. drama. Pirates of Silicon that, Valley. Right. Wow. This is, and I guess this is, uh, and it was um, Noah Wiley and Anthony Michael Hall. Right. 
Yeah. And they were jobs and jobs and gates or. Oh my God. Yeah, exactly. One. And it, it, it was really compelling uh, as a show back then. I, and that's one we should do a rewatch of is the Pirates of Silicon Valley because they kind of told, you know, the 70s and 80s of the making of Microsoft and Apple that lays the found work, the groundwork for startup culture and the boom post the, the both the dot com era and then after the dot com era we did have a couple of movies like startup with Khalil Aziz Tuzman in it if you remember that documentary uh, he wound up going to jail uh, for SEC violations <laughs> wow I knew him um, look at that I yeah and wow. then he, yeah. I mean I vaguely remember this title but did not watch any of it TNT yeah this was i mean this was you know this was pre peak tv it was if you were going to make a limited series it was basically basic cable or played HBO. Elizabeth holmes who is this melissa mcbride as elizabeth holmes who is this pretender <laughs> to the uh, elizabeth holmes role wait how that's is a, that's a different elizabeth that's a holmes. different elizabeth that's, holmes. that's not that's I'm not, not even that's not this. theranos liz holmes that's and also, not our melissa melissa mcbride she's from uh she's walking from walking dead. dead she's carol on walking dead yeah, so this is a young yeah, Melissa there she McBride, is. 20 yeah. years before yeah. Walking Dead. Speaking of which, should we turn to the dropout? Which wow. Well, that, that's, that was the, that's where I was trying to get us is, and then you build on top of that, obviously, seminal film, uh, The Social Network, then... That, to me, that's really... The th Social the Network is what's informed all of these subsequent shows. Like, that's the birth of this genre, the, like, yes. modern startup genre yep. that all started i think well they're because they're, they're sort of still following that pattern of the the protagonist is you know we're sort of taking this critical cynical view of them but we're also noting how you know their the the innovation and it's like this sort of balanced back and forth between they were doing these groundbreaking things but in this kind of morally questionable way and we're sort of back and forth with it yeah. And to just go one step back, Barbarians at the Gate was the story. Oh, of right. With uh, James R. Garner. R. Nabisco. Now, I, I don't know if that was an HBO movie. Yes, I believe Barbarians at the Gate. I might have been showed. It was, a, it was, it was premium cable. It was a sure. premium cable. That came out in 1993. And that's the earliest business drama I can remember. Right. But that was... That was like, that wasn't even tech. That was like HBO Nabisco or... It was it RJR was Nabisco. Nabisco, the yeah. cigarette yeah. company and all that. And the leverage buyouts. So right, it was sort of like right. big buyouts. There high was a, there was a whole the 80s kind of genre that, 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 that led into that, which was like, you know... Wall the, Street. Right, mm -hmm. or like other people's money, or, you know, all right. those stories about high finance and Wall Street tycoons and Larry the liquidator kind of guys and like yeah. that. And that's what kind of morphed into this, you know? Like, it's well, so I interesting mean, watching those genres example. build on each other uh, to, to this moment in time of prestige television where unlimited budgets are drawing just but the best I think actors in the world. What's so interesting is back in the 80s and 90s, it was, everything was more like super pumped where it was like, we're going to pull back the curtain and let you, the regular schlubs, see what the world of high finance and big business is really like. And now we get this more sort of nuanced, interesting take where it's like, they're, they're just, they're just flawed folks like everybody else. They just happen to have access to billions of dollars. Yeah. All right. Let's let, 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 tee it up for us. Uh, On that Mom, note, if you will. exactly. The dropout recap. Of, right. Uh, so this, this, we're, we're, I feel right. like Iron we're at the, we're at the moment ladies. in the dropout. Iron Sisters. Yeah. Iron Sisters was the, episode the, six. The, the most recent episode that, well, up until last night when the new one came. Uh, and we're, we're really kind of at the, the noose is starting to, to tighten. Like they're, mm. they're, they're in pretty deep now. They're actually using Siemens machines on patients from Walgreens. Uh, and they're kind of, misleading everybody into thinking it's their technology that they're using they're also using questionable tech that they're developing their edison machines to actually use on real life patients which is what starts to create qualms among their own staff and employees some internal division and we're also following outside the company uh all of the efforts to kind of start to investigate and look into what they're doing more deeply john carreyrou is now involved He's in communication with, uh, I'm blanking on some of the character names. Tyler Laurie, Schultz Tyler and Schultz. Erica Chung. I was going to say, right. That's how the, that episode ends with oh, these he's two. In, right, with D uh, Fuse, Dr. Fuse. Right, Dr. Richard Fuse, which is the William Fuse. H. Macy character, and then the, the Stanford professor played by Laurie Metcalf. They're, uh, basically, the forces that are 
very cynical about Theranos and what they're doing are aligning. The mobilizing. Mobilizing, mobilizing even, to yeah. begin a sincere look into what's really going on. And then, of course, Rochelle Gibbons, Ian Gibbons' widow, also joining that effort. Uh, and so collectively, now we're into the people are starting to gather evidence about the the bad things they've been doing. And then in the, you know, not to spoil the one that Lon hasn't seen, but the episode that came out last night is when we start to see this journalistic effort pay off, which gets extremely exciting, produces one of the best moments of like journalism TV that I feel like I have seen in ages. I mean, I was like jumping out of my my chair over it. But, you know, last time we talked about this show, I said, I think I'm to the point where I might start to get a little bit bored with how now that they've made the full turn into cartoonishly evil and i did it happen are you less interested now or more well luckily now that these supporting characters and the journalism stuff is picking up i'm definitely more interested but i'm also more uncomfortable like i mean there's so there were a couple moments in there where you actually think like you forget that you know how this story turned out and you think they're gonna kill someone like it's (laughs) you know they're talking about the security and there's this sense of danger that these two young people are in because they want to sort of be whistleblowers and you and there's this weird scene where you know erica chung is like all alone on thanksgiving has something go wrong and someone comes to fix the machine and sort of just like shoot the test result out anyway that feels almost x-files like it felt like they just sent an android in and it, yeah, it was foreboding it, like you, yeah. you really start to get that, that this is turning into a nightmare for everybody involved and that now we're going to move into, I don't know if this is like a second act kind of thing, but, you know, the war is basically starting. Uh, and they are Good versus so evil. Awful. And the evil up. is so evil that it's sort of like, I mean, I yeah. by, the, by the time I finished watching last night, I was like, I don't understand how that woman's not in jail. Why is she not in jail right now as opposed to just convicted? Like, woo. Yeah. I, for me, this is now getting even more riveting. Yeah. Because, yeah, it was kind of interesting to see her want to get out and not be in the mafia and they pulled her in right like she she had that moment in episode five i think it was where she's like well what if i just didn't do there right with her her mom mom. she was Mm -hmm. was telling her mom like maybe i'll just give all this up and the mom was like you know no you can't and 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 she goes to sunny balwani and says hey listen what if we just you know we just didn't do this anymore and it's like we're 150 million dollars in what do you mean yes uh and 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 now they're just like, now they're all in. Now you see her intimidate Tyler Schultz when he comes to her and tries to, you know, confront her and say, like, what's going on? Are we using these things? It's it. And she just is like, you don't know what you're talking. And you see that weird moment between her and Sonny Valwani, too, where he essentially says, like, I know everything that, you know, right. I have all of the receipts. And she's like, right. I'm the CEO. Maybe I don't read all my emails. Love you. Bye, <laughs> like, <Ooh>. Tiger. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, lots of founders are loosey-goosey with their personal numbers. We all know that. They put it on company documents, they use it for sales calls, and more. And that's where things get super messy. You, you don't know who's calling you, right? Is it a sales prospect? Is it a coworker? Or is it somebody from your kid's school? Is it spam? Well, Open Phone helps you create business phone numbers for you and your team. And it works through an app on your smartphone very elegantly or on your desktop. You just pick a number, you install the app, and you're done. There is no need to carry two phones like I do. And there's so many features you're going to love, including, you know how we all create catch-all emails like support at ourcompanyname.com? Well, you can do something similar for a phone number. You can have a shared phone number with multiple employees fielding those incoming texts and the calls. What a brilliant idea. See what Open Phone can do for you. It's already affordable at a starting price of just $10 a month per user. So affordable. And Twist listeners can get an extra 20% off any plan for your first six months by signing up at openphone.co slash twist. And if you have existing numbers from another service, no problem. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, Open Phone can port them over for free. Just head over to O-P-E-N-P-H-O-N-E dot C-O slash twist today. Openphone.co slash twist today. I, I love creepy? one thing that they're weaving into the show that I wasn't sure they were going to sort of deal with head on. That is, I think, pr- a pretty bold choice in, in 2022 is the way that uh, Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes kind of weaponized the fact that she was a woman and mm-hmm. how uh, scared people would be to confront this powerful woman uh, and and, you know, like these the sort of social pressure to not 
Uh, like even when Tyler Schultz brings up to uh, George Schultz, his grandfather, what's going on, it's immediately shaming them. Like Elizabeth is doing this amazing stuff and she's this incredible woman. And why would you try mm. to bring her down? She's trying to help so many people. And and I, I think that's really fascinating. It's because it's, it's complex, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can, it, it, there, there's a lot of shading there. Like you understand the motivation and we, you do want to support a, a young woman CEO. That is a rare and special thing in Silicon yeah. Valley that we should support. But at the same time, she was using that. And, and you said it's like, that's what's fueling so much of Laurie Metcalf's anger towards her. Uh, is yeah. that she's sort of abusing the fact that she's a woman. But I, I think that's a, it's a really interesting th theme they've come back to a few times now. Yeah, gender dynamics in Silicon Valley. Uh, who would have guessed it? What, what, did you <laughs> what do you think of yeah. that sort of angle, Molly, and, the, and gender in general? Oh, in 100. General? It, I mean, I am thrilled that the show is going there because this was always always a massive part of this story. And that the, that incredible confrontation that she has with Laurie Metcalf's character at the bar where you know in episode professor, seven yeah in episode seven sorry yeah. line uh, where she's it. like it's <laughs> not just you it's every woman ceo that's going to come after you and won't get funded as yeah. a result of what you have done here like you know the fact that you're this fraud means you're setting all these other women back and then there's also that great scene where this our kind of you know collaborator crew our motley crew of collaborators is sitting there going like why and it's the professor and dr ruse whose name i just said and instantly forgot um, and, and the wife of Ian Gibbons are sitting there talking about like why they're, why they're seeing her again, journalistic credulity, my God, on every magazine cover. And they're like, yeah, why is this woman getting everything? And he says, yeah. Dr. Fuse is like, it's cause she's young and blonde and pretty. And mm. then, you know, Lori Metcalf's character is like, well, she's a woman and you want to see him succeed. And, da -da -da -da. and he's like, yeah, she's young and blonde and pretty. And both of them are so right that you're just like, oh, society is the worst. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, just, I love where she's like, oh, it's so great to see you, Phyllis. And she's like, it's Dr. Gardner to you. <laughs> like, Do not <laughs> so call, you me don't Phyllis. call me yes. Phyllis. Yes. Not. That's I, and I think this right. new introducing John Carreyrou and that character and just how brave they were. And now we're getting basically all the president's men, shattered glass, that whole, what do they call it? Ovra? Ovra? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ovra. 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 I'm trying to use Ovra. a fancy word here. It's like we're kind of talking it. about this Crushing stuff. It. So this Ovra of journalism uh spotlight all the presidents man shatter glass hey we're going to expose this giant fraud and we're threatening to get sued is now being introduced so now you have the collision of two genres you know the investigative journalists um yeah. what was the other one um with uh, uh the guy from gladiator Russell the michael Crow. mann oh, movie uh, the insider the insider. The insider. Jeffrey mm. Wigand. Yeah. Jeffrey the, Wigand of the that insider. That was right. With Brown and Williamson, the, the tobacco company, and the Jeffrey whistleblower. Wigand was the whistleblower, right. and, Lo, and, and Al Pacino's the 60 like Minutes Aaron producer. Right. Yeah. And it's a great, by, it is a great flow because it's not this boring, ongoing exploration of the evil people. Russell now Crow. it's the effort, like the, the it's series is really well constructed because now they're telling a new story with new characters mm -hmm. who are yeah. super compelling. I call, I call that genre con, uh, competence porn. When you're just watching yes. people who are really good at something do their job very effectively, there's something very satisfying about that. Because it's Ooh. not like journalism is a good example, but like space is a whole like hidden figures and Apollo 13, where it's just like, I just want to watch like people who are very good at something do something that's very difficult. That is and, a like, great build it and point. succeed at it. Like that's it's a, it's a, there's something very the satisfying about it. Right. Yes. He's like the, the engineer Martian. in the Martian is yeah, like figuring right. out how to exactly. survive. Yes. It's like the MacGyver oh. kind of. But no, it's even better when so it's good. journalists doing something that feels, I don't know. Like righteous. Yeah, but it's like also clerical. That's what clerical. you want journalism to be. It's, it's also like clerical. Like I called a bunch of people and I asked them questions. And then it's I so saved boring. the world. It's not like, you know, I went outside in a space suit and I fixed the, you know, flux capacitor. They're like, yeah, I, I went and I talked to a doctor and I asked them three questions and they told me the truth after the three questions. And the fourth one, I actually got the piece of information, the four hour meeting that I needed. Boom. And now mm -hmm. we broke the whole thing open. To make that compelling, knocking on doors and asking questions right. is a tribute to, I think, the screenplay writer and the dialogue. And I mean, it's a little bit, I think these things are super collaborative. Like, obviously, the, you know, this was written with a real eye towards, just like Molly saying, like, bring it a lot. You can't just be in Elizabeth's head the whole time. Like, you've got to figure out 
where the beats are and like how this it, the world keeps sort of expanding because that's what happened. It's her. She started the company and then it grows and she's got all this staff and Sonny comes in and then people become, you know, Walgreens and then it becomes this, you know, huge news story. And that's that's the story you've got to tell. So it is that organization, but it's the direction too. it's the performances, too. I mean, it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. Editing even. I mean, that's like I was going to say the editing, too, especially to keep those things moving. Right. And certain, you know, and, and moving the, the between scene, things you know, without it getting confusing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of great jumps. I was watching some YouTube video about how the South Park guys kind of put together the show. And there's like, we don't have any ends in the script. Like this happens and this happens and this happens. It has to be this happens. Therefore, this happens. Right. This happens, but this happens. So he said the, the construction of South Park is therefore or but never end. And I, when I was watching the show, hmm. I was like, okay, lab technician finds out that the machines are not the right machines. Uh, therefore, they uh, send somebody down to do the test for her. But she tells Carrie Roo, therefore, Carrie Roo gets in touch with these people. And it just, yeah, you, you're just so paced into this that I can't look away. The, yeah, I mean, these shows are going to sweep amazing. up the Emmys. Correct, Lon? If you were to look oh, at this, I mean, I definitely think we're seeing some performances that are going to be remembered. I, I say, say Freak to me feels like a lock for a nomination at this point. Everybody's lock. talking. I've, I've seen a lot of people talking about that performance. She's nailing the voice. They are doing the look very well. It's very like memorable. I feel like, uh, and I the feel like dancing, oh, the dancing dance with the mask the physical, of her own face on. Like, yeah. Her physical acting, the way she has nailed that weird dancing, and then how she like runs all strange, like mm -hmm. her She's physical transformation awkward. is phenomenal. I think, I mean, I hate to diagnose, but it feels like an Asperger-y spectrum kind of personality but well, they set that up in that first episode remember yeah. she's like you know or second where she's like you know i don't feel people things the way that normal people right. do i think that was sort of the like throw that out there and but say yeah, she's but, on but the without spectrum. putting like a point on it without being right. like here's the here's what's wrong with her here's the diagnosis or here's how she's weird it's it's like they're yeah it feels like you know shaded and like you know unpredictable in, in a way i also was going to say i think uh I think Anne Hathaway and, and, and Jared Leto are also sort of in, in, in the mix at this point. I mean, it's Amazing. a long year. I mean, year. if Jared Leto doesn't get an Oscar. It's a long year. Actor. Who knows Who knows what happens between now and, and you mm -hmm. know, the Emmys. But uh, I, I feel like those are the, the those are all very much in play, along with writing and, and, and directing. And, and all mm -hmm. right. Hiring software engineers can take a really long time, don't I know it? Sometimes it takes months, but gun.io is going to change that for you right now. They're a developer hiring platform. They're super focused. And here's what makes them different. Their candidates are expertly vetted. And then they're matched to your company by a team of senior engineers, not by an algorithm or just a recruiter. Gun.io developers have eight plus years of experience building products and they're comfortable working directly with founders and executive teams. They're going to get you candidates as quickly as 48 hours. Think about that. And the average time to hire is only two weeks. 90% of the candidates are US based. And they have a network of vetted international candidates as well. If you're looking to hire from other markets, there are two ways you can use gun.io. Number one, you could work with a freelancer and enjoy gun.io's ongoing support services. They'll handle the billing and swap out talent for free at any time. Or you can hire a remote developer directly from the gun.io network for half the typical recruiter's fee. So here's your call to action. Gun.io is the easiest way for startups to find and hire world-class developers. And you're going to get $250 off your first hire at gun.io slash TWIST. We're going to wrap, but I just got to ask you, since you are in Hollywood and you cover it. Well, I'm near uh, Here it comes. <laughs> what happened at the oscars and <laughs> what should be the proper fault because we're it's kind of over now we've all processed it sure and i'm sure that you have a lot of thoughts on just all the processing of it the question i have now is the end game the off-ramp how this all gets settled yeah. because the academy it, it, has a code of conduct they're right. investigating him the apologies has been have been given but i think now the fallout is what in hollywood well Come and on. to add to that do you believe for a second that the academy really asked him to leave well, they're already sort of, they're already kind of walking that back. Uh -huh. The academies now, they're, they're, they're saying they're, they're investigating. There's going to be some kind of 
panel that's making a decision about what happens with Will Smith. I do not feel like they take a, an Oscar back. I think that's a huge, I don't think they want to cross that line because now the moment you take one person's Oscar back because of bad behavior, it's like, well, you know, Roman Polanski has some Oscars yeah. and Woody Allen <laughs> has some Oscars and Harvey, Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein has dozens of Oscars. And yeah. I mean, now you're starting a process that doesn't end until you go back and review the career of literally everybody. And I don't think they want to cross. I don't think they want to go down that rabbit hole. I, I, I think they'll probably come up with some sort of slap on the wrist type thing to be like, we're taking this seriously, but not not that seriously. Uh, that's what I think is uh, they're already in terms of the did we ask and believe they're saying, well, there were, now they're saying there were mixed messages. So some people were maybe suggesting to Will Smith that he should leave, but other people, it was not a you got to go. Eat it. They were, yeah. Initially, they were making it sound like somebody came up to him and like, Will Smith, get out of here. And he was exactly. like, exactly. And no. he was like, nah. And like, yeah. that's not what happened. No. Uh, they so, talked to his publicists or his people and said, hey, maybe he should leave. We've mm -hmm. gotten a lot of reports that, you know, he was talking to Denzel Washington. He was talking to Tyler Perry. He was talking you to saw Diddy. That on video. They had pictures. Right. And we th like there were a lot of cover. It was a very chaotic few minutes. And I mean, even Questlove was talking about because that was the award that was being handed out was uh, yeah. the team from Summer of Soul won for best documentary. It's a great movie. It's on Hulu now. Highly recommended. Uh, and, you know, so even their view on the chaos was like they thought it was a bit. So they were like, do we go? Do we go up and get the award? Is it is the bid? Oh, like they don't, you know, they're in the confusion yeah. of the moment. Chris Rock decides to move ahead and give out the award, which but was everybody right in that do, room is doing the yeah. same thing mm -hmm. we were doing at home. Like what? What's going mm -hmm. on? Well, and then did you see this new development too, where one of the producers of Summer of Soul had a long tweet thread the other day, basically being like, "Not only was that whole experience for us, and it ruined our, it unquestionably ruined our moment, but on top of that." Chris Rock then made this lazy, crappy joke about four white guys coming yeah. to accept the the award, he said, and he this said, producer yeah. tweeted about it as South Asian, and was basically just like, "Everybody involved, you suck. Like you're <laughs> both, you're all." <laughs> Which I was like, fair. "Fair." Yeah, I mean, I think that 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 is my overall take is that it was a crummy joke that probably Chris Rock should not have have made, definitely in light of her illness, but also you 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 can't you, you can't hit, especially during the Oscars, you don't. Know, you don't some, get up and hit somebody. So. Some bigger interpretation in terms of this moment in time in society, or is this like uh, I don't? I, and, yeah, you know, the, I, I see the comedians like, are like, "Oh my god, comedy will never be the same." I, People I are going to feel like on that level, we're yeah. reading a little too much. Like, yeah, I I've been around dudes who hit other dudes after that dude said something about their girlfriend. Like, I think haven't yeah, most of us been in, in a that bar. situation? Have you you've seen that happen? The only thing that is different or weird about this is that it was the Oscars. Like yeah, the so idea that a guy made fun of somebody else's wife and then that guy hit that guy is like, well, that's not <laughs> weird. <laughs> that happens yeah, all the time. That happens all the time. So but you this shouldn't, idea that it's not an endorsement, and, but no, I don't think is this is like the going to change forever where comedians now you, you can't going forward, have Ricky Gervais do a roast like golden globes anymore. That's off the table for now. Like the next couple of years, no more making really fun of celebrities. I really don't are, think so. Are going to be safe in comedy clubs? You believe any of that hyperbolic or I, whatever strong reaction? I really don't. I really don't think so. I really don't. I really think this is gonna. This is gonna fade. I think within a few years there'll be a Super Bowl commercial with Will Smith and Chris Rock sharing a Corona or you know <laughs> candy <a> bar <laughs> ha going halves on a Little Caesars or something. Like I think this is gonna be. You know, I think this is going to fade. And I definitely don't think this is the end of roasts or making fun of celebrities. You have to do some of that. I'm not saying this joke was appropriate. No. I, I think it was mean spirited, especially because she's been so it's open mean. recently about her alopecia diagnosis. If it was ad libbed, you know, it sounds like or it might have been ad libbed. Yeah, that's I do it believe was it was ad libbed because I don't think you write down a GI Jane reference in 2022. I do think that was off the cuff. I'm sorry, it was, it was, it I mean, was out of he line. He said he didn't. Kind of even I mean, the, the thing I always wanted to know was did he know he had this, she had this disease, or was he just referring to her having a haircut? I style. don't know, but we'll uh, know. it's a, it's a, we'll it's know. low hanging fruit. It's a really dumb, easy joke. He's gone after Jada Pickett Smith before. There's uh, something an ill advised They're friends. Joke. That's the other thing that's crazy is like, after this whole thing happened, there's a thousand pictures of them together, you know, at various events, smiling and well, sure, themselves I mean, together. So they're, they're both very prominent celebrities. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, you know. Yeah, it's a very weird moment. Uh, but it's I'm a very it's weird moment. I mean, I've, you know, I've, 
<laughs> give us, uh, as, we, as we wrap here, give us a suggestion, yeah. something you're watching uh, or you've watched over last year that was exceptional that maybe people missed and then what you're most looking forward to as we wrap. Uh, I, there's a there's a show on HBO Max uh, right now called Our Flag Means Death that I've just jumped into. Uh, it is it is based on a real historical pirate named Steed Bonnet, who was a like a wealthy aristocrat who gave up his boring life on the manor and became a pirate and like made, got his own ship and ended up working with Blackbeard. Uh, Taika Waititi uh, produced and directed some episodes of this, and he plays Blackbeard in it. Reese Darby, uh, who you might know from the Jumanji films, uh, and he was in Flight of the Concords. He stars as Steve Bonnet. Great cast, really oh, fun. It's got comedy. It's a it's a pirate show. It's got some action, uh, and that just wrapped up. So you could you could binge oh, the whole Reese Darby first season. from the um. He's the man. He was the Flight of the Concords manager. Yes, if you watch, I Flight loved of the him. Yeah, when he would take. Uh, in Flight of the Concord, where you take attendance yeah, in their exactly, like meetings, right. exactly. Uh, oh, he's great, Taika TT, great, and like there's a you'll recognize a lot of like Joel Fry, who was in Cruella, he's on board this boat. There's some uh, Game of Thrones guys who uh, pop up in and the then show. Most looking forward to it was a great, great, uh, wow. What a, let me let me, I'm, I'm gonna be on maybe. I'm oh, sure. Looking, I mean, Moon Knight just started. I'm looking forward to digging that. Oh, there's there's Apple. Apple has got uh, two things coming out that I'm looking forward to. Slow Horses, which is, I believe, this week. Uh, with uh, That's with Gary Oldman, and it's a spy Ooh. series. It's about Ooh. like uh, the worst spies at MI5 in London all <laughs> get put in like the, the, the storage closet where they hide like the useless people they don't have any need for. And it's this small office run by Gary Oldman, and they're like the misfits and the rejects. But then they stumble into an actual espionage case. Slow uh, horses. Coming slow horses. That's based on a book, TV which Plus. I have not read, but it looks good. And uh, I, I like uh, Gary Oldman. So I'm going to check oh, I it fuck out. With Gary Oldman. I love Gary yeah. And then yeah. uh, Shining Girls. I don't think that starts till May, but that's a big one coming to Apple TV Plus with Elizabeth Moss. Uh, and it's like a, thriller? Sort of a crime thriller, but with a fantasy element that I don't know much Ooh. about. Uh, so I can't spoil. But basically, she survived. She's a Chicago archivist. She survived some kind of attack. And then she starts investigating other people who have been involved, who've been attacked in a similar Ooh. way, but like wow. seemingly impossible, like a person who was attacked in this way 20 years ago or in a different city or in a different oh. part of the world. So it's like, how is this person, how is this assailant doing this? Hmm. So maybe like supernatural kind of I believe of the there is a supernatural or a fantasy element, but I don't know what it would be. And Jamie ah. Bell uh, is the, is the nefarious, uh, person who oh. she's sort of investigating wow i i mean when elizabeth moss comes on the screen and um yeah i mean that, cow, it's, uh, like, this wow. is what she kind of is executive producing and was like driving this one to the screen so and it looked just like trailer came out the other day it looks really good it's also got uh philippa sue from hamilton uh is in the mix there so looks good love love amazing all right, there you have it, everybody. Follow at lons on the twitter lons uh go to inside.com slash streaming to get his newsletter it's absolutely go. amazing and then we'll have the new community site launch tonight lon mm. it looks like it's it's starting to uh percolate people are liking so tonight 9 p.m pacific i've time. already been using it but you've been just using, the i mean it's pretty cool you have to admit yeah no i think people are gonna like it i think people are gonna like this new participatory newsletter system i built with lon okay well, uh molly uh any closing thoughts there or should we wrap here no but i hope that lon's will that lon will join us at top gun Jason has promised oh. to rent out a movie theater for the yes, Top Gun gonna, release because it's I'm my in. birthday. And we're going to do a Molly birthday. So, I have uh, the need for speed. And it's so. my all-time favorite movie because I'm <laughs> trying to be like that. Have, have I seen the new one? No, yeah. I haven't seen the new one. What's the buzz? Because mm -hmm. I heard buzz from people who said this is the greatest thing Tom Cruise has ever done. I yeah, do I'm like it's uh, Joseph Kaczynski directed it. He did that one Oblivion with Tom Ooh. Cruise, which is really Ooh. good. Um, yes. Oblivion was I, good. I, like, I like that one. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, my dog's name, they're asking in the comments. Taco, Taco, the Taco. Ah, oh, look you. Look at Taco. Oh, how old is Taco now? No, no idea. I adopted him. They thought he was like six or seven. That was three years ago. So nine, nine ten. Who was the dog before Taco? Uh, Buddy, Buddy Johnson. Buddy, oh, yeah, yeah Buddy. Uh, God, the old days. Fondue passed the other day. Oh, you remember Fondue right. from the uh, sure. of holidays? I remember you remember Tor when I brought Tor it there? Fifteen years, nine. I'm old enough to remember Tora. Her sleep. 
You remember Tora, my original bulldog, eight and a half years. Yeah, that years. was when I... When Tora's Fondue's brother, right brother, 12 and a half years. Fondue, 15 years, nine months, and just passed in her sleep the other week. And, oh, but, but, she oh, had a good run. Yeah. She had the greatest of bulldog runs. Yeah. Uh, rest in peace. And uh, now we have Maximus, our fourth bulldog. My fourth bulldog. I'm starting to realize you've had two mm -hmm. dogs in your life, Lon, as an adult. Uh, th as an adult, yes. I, I grew up, we had a schnauzer when I was, uh, when yeah. I was younger. So you're two. I'm now on my fourth. I think this is like yeah. you start to realize, like as a dog person, how many dogs you had. And, sure. Uh, what joy they bring to your life. All right, everybody. Yeah. Shout out Lon Harris. And thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Lon. We'll see you next Thursday. And next up on the show, we have a really interesting interview with David Rodolitz, who's the CEO and co-founder of New York City's first NFT dining club. Get ready for some buzzwords, but also possibly a quite interesting concept. Great business models partners with Gary V. Stick with us. In other news, NFTs have uh, been absolutely brutal to cover because... God, the majority of them are just some weird, wacky grift, and there's so much uh, mashugana, stupidity, grift in them that it's hard to know um, what's real and what's not. And I was reading about NFTs for access, and I thought NFTs for access are such a great idea. The one idea that I thought was particularly great was there's a restaurateur. And he decided, he's been in the hospitality uh, industry for over two decades, he decided he would create something in New York called the Fly Fish Club, and that it would be an NFT-gated dining club. Now, what's a dining club? Well, we're about to find out. Uh, welcome to the program, David Rodelitz. Did Rodelitz. I get it correct? That's a, you, you did all right, Rodelitz. Rodelitz. Okay, Rodelitz. you heard my little preamble there, uh, Meet Molly yeah. Wood. So, uh, David, tell us, uh, you're creating this club. And I think it's based on a phenomenon that happened in Spain uh, for food clubs or not? No, it, it okay. is not. So, okay. I mean, my partners and I have been in the hospitality industry for the last 20 years. There's a common theme that, you know, relying on restaurant EBITDA as a, as a business model is very challenging. Um, we all love food and beverage. Everybody likes being around it. We love creating social experiences. The problem, though, is you put in all this work, you raise all this money. And at the end of the day, it's really hard to even extract 10, 15% margin. So for a while, uh, I'm a finance guy. I've been a business guy for a long time. I've been trying to find new models or ways to monetize the food and beverage industry. It also lacks a lot of technology. It's an industry that's been a little bit dated with its practices. Earlier last year, I teamed up with a, a, a good friend of mine, but also a, a very big tech media and marketing mogul, Gary Vaynerchuk. And, you know, he's kind of all things, you know, best in class from marketing tech and myself and my uh, operating partners, Josh Capon and Connor Hanlon, who are um, large chefs in the, in the New York area. We, we formed up and, and thought, what does hospitality look like when you bring these practices, you know, tech, marketing, branding on top of hospitality operators, people that care, what could that yield? What would that create? Um, so that's how VCR Group started, which is our parent Got hospitality it. company. I juxtaposed another project in New York that I had read about in the same article. Which one is that? I forgot the name of it, but they were based upon this phenomenon in Spain where you can kind of go in the kitchen and cook. So it's sort of like Soho House for yeah, chefs. I forgot the uh, name of that one. I think you're going to start to see a lot of different people try to find ways to penetrate this technology and use it because everyone has a lot there's a lot of mystique around it and people are throwing around this word and for us this is not about a digital collectible this is not about is a picture of a ape or a crypto punk or a rock worth millions of dollars or not um it's not about a speculative crypto investment this is about utility it's Got about it. access so let's go through the mechanics right tell you us buy an NF how many nfts mm -hmm. did you produce what did you sell them for what do i get if i bought one Sure. So we produced 3,035 tokens was uh, broken down into two tiers. There's a fly fish token that will get you access. The, the club is not open yet. We are securing the real estate and then we'll be building it. So we've done all of this, you know, uh, ahead of securing the real estate. We, it was really important for us to be first. Um, and all of us have, uh, independent brands that we felt like we had enough credibility to put ourselves out there and do this first. 
So we, we created a fly fish club. The first tier is a fly fish token. It gets you access to the restaurant, uh, a cocktail bar, um, a main dining room and an outdoor space. Then there's a fly fish omakase token, which gets you access to everything I just mentioned, plus a private omakase room that is going to be curated by a leading Michelin star, uh, omakase master who happens to be our partner on another restaurant that we own called Ito. Uh, 3,035 tokens were produced. Um, the majority of those were the fly fish token, 2,650. And then about 385 or so were the omakase token. We minted or we sold um, in January about 1,501 tokens that sold out in less than one minute. And the rest I've held back in the fly fish wallet. And the idea behind that is um, we need to see the people's behavior on how they're utilizing the token. You know, our intent is that we want to build the most awesome dining club, but this is our in real life experience. This is not about a metaverse play. This is about leveraging technology to make uh, an industry better and to find new ways to have a healthy business model. So that so was normally our- these would be investors, correct? You would yeah. go and pass the hat to investors instead, more like Soho House. So you sold 2,650 of these NFTs for the fly fish. 1,500, no, no, we sold 1,501. Oh, 1,500 of them. We've yeah. held back about 1,500. Got it. And the idea and behind those heldbacks is to make sure that there's local people in the Northeast New York area that want to use it rather than just people, you know, uh, across the country buying it for a, a speculative investment. Ah, because so you need the, people to come in, right? That's correct. Next. We need it to be a, a bustling, you know, uh, experience-driven dining club filled with people enjoying themselves and wanting to come back multiple times weekly. So 1500. So can we go all the way back to the basics here, which yeah. is the fly fish club itself? Like, can we start with what is a dining club? Yeah. So a dining club, I mean, similar, you just referenced Soho House. You know, there's a lot of different places that are social experiences that you go to. Um, there's some sort of vetting process. And essentially you're in a community and you're, you're essentially like renting a social experience. You pay an annual fee. Mm -hmm. Um, you have a food and beverage minimum sometimes, whether it's your local country club, whether it's a so house, which is in, you know, a ton of different markets, um, zero bond in New York. There's a lot of different ones. Our whole idea was, um, we like the model, but we want to flip it on its head. So there's no vetting process. There's no application process. There's no recurring fee process. We didn't want to forward all these costs onto the consumer every year. So you buy our NFT. We mm -hmm. minted them. The Flyfish one was 2.5 Ethereum and the Flyfish Omakase was 4.25 Ethereum. People mint, you know, bought those from us directly. The, the term minting is essentially just turning a digital file into a digital asset. Mm -hmm. Um, now people own their memberships. They could do what they want with it. They could use it. They could sell it. They could lease it if they're, if they're not using it. Um, so it purely puts the power into their, into their hands. Yeah. Um, so why, why is the NFT the better way to do that? I think the NFT, well, NFTs authenticate ownership. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, this is the technology, which, which is what I think people are missing of why this is so transformative and why in the macro NFTs are not going away. In the micro, you're going to see a lot of bad projects and people with the wrong intent trying to make a lot of money off them. And we're already starting to see that. Um, but I think the utility behind it and being able to authenticate ownership in a very quick way and then being able to seamlessly transfer or sell that ownership in an instant way without, you know, five middlemen and months in between is a remarkable innovation. And then additionally, mm -hmm. the smart contract allows you to create this relationship digitally between you and the people that want this product. So you could create different um things in that smart contract like royalties and such which is why you're starting to see artists musicians um and other businesses are going to put their ip um you know and sell things through nft because they're not going to get removed from the transaction down the road so stupid question i come yep. in i have the nft yep. i paid a couple couple grand for a couple of ethereum do i show you it on my phone somehow to get into the restaurant is this now 
like you know, you used to have a Soho House card, or you yeah. you would be greeted at the Soho House. They would look up your membership number. That's is there right. a mechanical device to do this? Yeah. So I mean, your phone is going to basically authenticate that you are a member, and that's going to give you access to a private reservations portal that will have uh, an a, an allotment of inventory. Um, so essentially, um, your ownership is validated, and then once it is. You then have access to our reservations platform, which will be mobile and desktop friendly. And then you make a reservation like you would on a resi or an open table or a seven rooms. Amazing. All of that process will be the same. It's just about, you know, getting access to a private portal, which will be authenticated versus blockchain. So super clarify, you can only make that reservation if you are a Flyfish token holder. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. You can so bring guests with your token. You could bring guests to the size of a table. If you have a six stop, you could bring five guests, um, but you have to be a member to enjoy the Flatfish Club. Yeah. Right. And so this could be done with a normal app, but then you wouldn't have the ability to trade it. You wouldn't have the ability to loan it out. So you're saying if, you know, this five Flyfish Club became super popular and I, you know, didn't live in New York, I could rent it for 10000 a year to somebody who did live in New York. That's correct. The, the idea of the leasing mechanism was designed as an ancillary benefit. We're not looking for this to be the, the reason why people buy it as like a, mm -hmm. a passive income strategy or anything of that sort. The idea was we have a lot of uh, relationships and people that are well-traveled. They might leave town over the summer times. And we thought that it would be a neat idea for them to Amazing. be able to lease their token out and get new people to discover Flyfish Club and kind of create this very circular uh, people speaking about it, discovering it, and then hopefully wanted to participate in, in, in the future. And well, I feel like this is where the authentication comes in super handy because like, you know, I have belonged to a health club where I could resell my membership. You buy the memberships on Craigslist because they go, you know, they, they've structured in that way, but they have to put in a bunch of rules around who can use it and guests and when and whatever, mm. because there's a higher likelihood of fraud. That's so right. it's sort of like this model has already existed, but what you're saying is the NFT mechanism makes it more secure. It makes it more secure. It makes it more seamless. I mean, the blockchain, you know, is, is authenticating, you know, through computers and servers, you know, the, the validity of the ownership. Um, so that's already happening. We're using the technology to uh, improve uh, an in real life dining experience. And there's also other benefits to it in our minds. I mean, people are communicating digitally. Social currency is real. You know, NFTs, everybody, you know, a lot of people are very interested in what this whole kind of movement is there's a community around this being built there's people in discords that are spending a lot of time getting to know each other and like you know i've been a part of other restaurant groups that i've co-founded and created for years and i can tell you in the last three months of fly fish club we have more of a connection with these people and there's cool. more brand being built in three months than other projects i spent 10 years on we're, so we were just in Miami with these people. We rented a yacht. We took, you know, all of our members away. We've done three different, you know, physical and virtual events. We're doing cooking demos with these people. We're really creating a sense of community. And I think this kind of crypto NFT movement, not all of it, but what we're seeing with our club um, is people that want to collaborate, people that want to meet new people, people that like, mm. you know, social experiences. So we're leveraging the NFT to make this in real life social experience better. And, and just to go through the math, I mean, it's really staggering. You sold if I my back of the envelope math, 1500 members for the fly fish, and then 385 for the omakase, I think you said uh, 12, uh, 1501 was the total perfect uh, broken down between omakase and oh, okay. fly fish. We, br we brought in uh, over 10 million, uh, about a little north of 14. Oh, wow. And then uh, because of the royalty component, and the, the, the largest proof that this is an asset is that people could sell it to somebody else if they want to on a secondary market called OpenSea, yeah, which that's is essentially, happening. That's, mm -hmm. ha that, that's happened over $23 million of times in the Crazy. last three months. So we, wow. take, we take a royalty of 10% on all of those transactions. Oh, Got that's it. fantastic. So yeah. you have an ongoing stake in it. Now, how big is the first restaurant and how long does my membership last? And I don't own equity in the, this. So I'm not, no, if it becomes is not profitable, a security. it's not this, a security. It's just a membership it's card. Access. This it's is access. a different form of access. Got you it. have it as long as you want to own the token. 
how many could. years will the club exist? So if I have this and I give it to my kids, is this going to exist for 100 years? Or did you promise people you have a five year lease or a 10 year lease no, on the there, new there, place? There, there's no term on it. Um, okay, you know, our, our intent is to build a large business around this with multiple clubs, um, ancillary mm -hmm. offerings, uh, other social experiences, pop up events and build a whole world around wow. fly fish club. So, Amazing. you know, anything could happen and there's risk in anything, obviously. And I'm, you know, I, I, I can't just say like, yes, we're definitely going to have our, the same restaurant, you know, for a hundred years there that's going to exist. That being said, um, we're, we're very good at what we do. Uh, we have big plans to do this. We're well capitalized to do it. Clearly. Um, yeah. And we're going to look to create endless value for our people. How, how big is the first restaurant? How many, it'll how many about covers? 10, it'll be about 10,000 square feet. So 10,000 square feet. So it costs you three or 4 million to set up a restaurant like no, that in New York? a lot more. A lot oh. more. Yeah. Um, but then the finishings people come, and the quality that we want, it'll be, you know, very well done. But people are going to go there and have to still pay for the food. You're not getting oh. free food, just to be clear. 100%. So the business could work on its own. The only criticism I've heard of this is the exclusivity. So yep. you've taken a very democratic approach. If I bought it, or I should say if Molly bought it and she's super classy, and then she decides, you know, I'm not living in New York anymore. I'm going to sell it to J. Cal, and I buy it, and I'm a loud mouth, and I'm, you know, obnoxious at the club. <laughs> you have no control over the membership, whereas Soul House is like, oh, we don't want any bankers here. We don't want any finance people. Sure. And they literally rebooted New York Soul House because it became all wankers, yep. and they wanted more artists. So they just didn't renew all the banker memberships, and they started over. You actually can't do that. You can't control who owns the, the thing. So what happens if it becomes all finance bros and becomes a bro down? Good point. So we thought through that. Um, we did want to make this democratic and, and make it accessible. That being said, there's a couple levers that are being thought about here. The first one is that by nature of the product and how you have to buy a token using crypto, having a Coinbase, setting up a MetaMask, you generally have to be well versed or be interested in learning about mm. this, which is a certain subset of people. A lot of we, bros, crypto bros. I know, I'm like, no, then, no, no, but that still sort bros. of sounds like finance bros. Um, secondly, we, there was a whitelist that was created, um, which was people that we um, sold to before the public minting. There was ah. a private minting, which was about 20% of the inventory, mm -hmm. which were the local New York people that, you know, run in different circles and will hopefully be, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a very good complimentary group to the project. And then the last piece, was the mo which is the most important piece, is that I I've cloned a set of inventory which I have, my group has in our wallet, which every day we're hand selecting people in the area, mm -hmm. you know, from art to philanthropy, to sports, to entertainment, yep. to culture. And gotcha. we are going to curate an environment that is enjoyed, that is collaborative and with Got all it. walks of life. So, so you can hold back tokens and then curate to make sure you exactly have balance, right. which is exactly I, what I, the battery I, did in... Um, San Francisco, they had it was a bunch of VC bros and CEOs. And it was like, Oh, my God, this is leaning so bro, so rich and elite. And then one night I was there, and it was all artists, whatever. And I was talking to the founders. And they were like, that's the San Francisco Philharmonic. And that's the ballet, they come here every night after their performances, we gave yeah. them $200 a year, $500 memberships, so they could you know, uh, somebody who's in the ballet or in the symphony yeah. is not going to be able to afford 3000 a year in all likelihood for the luxury of paying $18 for a cocktail. That's right. So you can stack the deck with artists and interesting people. That's right. That's our plans. We're well connected with a lot of different, you know, groups of mm. people in this area. So it, it's about curating an environment, which is, mm. you know, uh, stuff that we've been doing for a long time. Absolutely You're amazing. I what do you uh, what has the reaction been in the restaurant community you've been in the restaurant community for a while people must be calling you saying <laughs> oh my god um how do i replicate this and then yeah. what happens if this becomes the new standard will we have two classes of restaurants the ones open to the public and the ones for the elite because that is I, the next criticism of this yeah. so address that one like uh, oh, I, is Manhattan going to become just all exclusive no, clubs no 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 there, there's a big learning curve to do this there's a large expense to create this I spent the greater part of last year building this out with my team. We had 15 developers from web two to web three, uh, you know, and front end designers, full stack engineers like this. This was not something that we came up with overnight. You know, we spent over a million dollars building this out or, you know, over the last 12 months. Um, 
So I don't see it all becoming NFT land. I, I think you have to come back to why, you know, if people are doing this for the wrong intent, you know, I think the projects are going to fail. If you're really trying to create a sense of community, find a new way, you know, we really wanted to leverage technology to find a new way to do our business because our business is flawed. So th- we're hospitality lovers, food and beverage lovers. We love being in real life with people. We just now have found a new way to, to monetize, which I think is going to provide us a leg up and it's going to allow us to be more hospitable and less transactional because all supply chain issues, labor cost issues, I won't have to forward every dollar along to the consumer because I'm only relying on restaurant EBITDA. I, I think the community as a whole has been pretty wowed by this. A lot of you know serious groups from around the world have reached out and has sparked another innovation that we're thinking about right now. But you know, it, it, the groups that are able to do it, I think, have to have a thoughtful approach. There has to be a real value proposition. Um, it doesn't hurt that Gary Vaynerchuk's my business partner, uh, yeah. who you know has a, a tremendous platform and provides a tremendous amount of value to people all around the world. And he's become a, a pioneer and a trailblazer in the NFT space. You know, I don't want people to be mistaken that you know you could just kind of come to market with this and people are going to buy it. Um, I think everything really has to line up and you have to have a, an ability to, you know, market and, and get this in front of people. And I I think us being first with a very thoughtful product, with Gary as a partner, with chef partners that are very well respected, um, with the timing of NFT and crypto being this kind of explosive thing right now, I think was the perfect, uh, Hmm. formula for us that a little bit of luck and a lot of thought created this excitement around Flyfish Club, but let's not confuse anything. We need to execute. We, we do not want to be a one and done. It's great that we have some money in the bank, but we now have to spend that money to curate a really beautiful and thoughtful experience. And if we don't provide value, we're not going to be able to then do future ones. I mean, I think that is the biggest challenge you have. People are paying 10, 14K for these tokens now. Uh, and- some people, well, that, that was on the minting. Yeah. You know, the, the Flyfish token, the general one went up to you know, mid twenties and the Omakase one, some traded at $60,000. So, so there's a lot of expectations. Yeah. I don't, I've never heard of a private restaurant club. That's 60,000. Although if you put it over 10 years, if this lasts at least 10 years, it'd be 6,000 a year, which is double so house, I guess. So yeah. it's yeah, still I mean, a lot of expectation. Yeah. You got to knock it out of the park. Yeah. I mean, the idea obviously is that there's not this reoccurring fee model that other clubs have. And the more important part though, is that it's an asset and that you could do what you want with it. And if we execute our plans, hopefully that will be valuable to other people down the road. So, you know, what would, uh, what would your table at Rayos actually be? What would that asset be if it was an asset? Not just that you have that table. What happens if you could sell that table? Not just give it away on a charity, you know, like a lot of people do, but if, if the families that were grandfathered into their Rayo's table a hundred years ago, if they could actually say, if it was in a real asset. I don't know, you tell me, what would it be worth a hundred? But I mean, I, I would think at least. So yeah. um, I think that's the- Fascinating. You Do you know, get 10% uh, of the leasing option as well as the sale option? Yeah, all, all, all leasing, all resales. Um, the leasing mechanism is, is being developed. It's not fully done yet. Mm. Um, and again, that, that I- I want that to be a very small piece of this business. Right. Um, the intent of it was really good, but we're definitely hearing um, a lot of people are asking questions, ongoingly asking questions about it, which is making us feel like some people are just doing it for the leasing mechanism without intent mm. to be there. And mm. yeah, that's another challenge. Like, what if right. people are the Airbnb buying factor? This? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What if everybody's just an investor, not a consumer uh, again that that's why that 1500 other tokens were held back that that was a really important piece mm. that mm-hmm. is a hedge against people's behavior and so people's thoughtful. intent yeah so the can you boot people i mean is there any mechanism to say we're revoking your token we, we we've thought about it and we really just have to see how um the experience goes and how people interact with the space mm-hmm. i think ultimately if if, if people um, don't act responsibly in a space or a threat to other people or are, are, are doing something that's, that's not proper. We'll have to address that. Like we have Code a conduct. We have to, yeah, that's exactly right. Like, conduct, yeah. It doesn't matter how much money you have. If you're not, you know, yeah. following through with the, the rules and guidelines, you know, we'll have to address that. Yeah. It's just a simple code of conduct. Maybe people have a dress code. If you, that's you right. know, if you, so some places you can't show up in flip flops. The answer, right. I mean, unless you're Adam Newman. 
Uh, who are the most famous people who bought tokens? You got any uh, super famous elite people? Uh, we, that, we have uh, a lot of famous elite people, none that I feel comfortable disclosing. Well, some of I'm them have to be public. Mm -hmm. Are people making it their Twitter avatars? Anybody make it their uh, Twitter? Yeah, I mean, some people have made it public, like, you know, Brooklyn Beckham, uh, you know, is a friend and supporter and a token holder. Um, we have a couple of Yankees that are on the squad. Um, a lot of people that have been discreet so far about okay, it. And, all right. Um, we'll keep it that way for now, but I, I feel comfortable right. saying that it's going to be a good mix of, um, you know, uh, of all walks of life in the club. Will Smith can't buy a token. He's got a <laughs> no, so no bad behavior. There. Behave everybody. Mm -hmm. All right. Listen, it's super innovative. Uh, congratulations. I grew up Appreciate in the restaurant it. business. I know how hard it is. Appreciate and anything it. that, you know, helps restaurant tours be able to take a longer view and not live under the stress that I watched my family go through living month to month in the restaurant business in Brooklyn, I think is beautiful and wonderful. And uh, I love the innovation. Tell Gary, I said hi. Will do. Really appreciate you guys having me on. David Thanks, Rattles, lot, thanks so much. Take, take care. care. That was great. I, I am absolutely in love with this concept of membership clubs and people being able to uh, support restaurants in advance of them opening. And there's some hard questions, of course. But I, I, what did you think, Molly? I liked, I liked his answers. It felt thoughtful. I would like to see a version of this that, I mean, and I think it'll develop, like, I'd like to see a version of this that isn't for the Yankees, right? Like, I want to support my local bars and restaurants. And I think post pandemic, Ooh. there's going to be an interesting transition for the restaurant industry, Ooh. because their costs are so much higher, and they're probably going to remain high. Ooh. And I would love to be able to buy a, a, a token that is effectively a subscription and a support mechanism for we, my local restaurant. I'm not interested in all this like elite NFT the, capitalization crap. Sorry. Like, hey, what was the name uh, of the company that was doing Kickstarter and then came to our accelerator? I've got their original name. Bizly. Bizly. Get the Bizly. Get, clip all this and send it to the Bizly make founder. It, make it a token. Make it a token and an NFT. And if they I mean, did that for a cafe because and they it's did the environmentally whole indefensible, but <laughs> What's that? Or don't do a token because it's environmentally indefensible. Well, come on. Now, I don't think these things have to be like a Bitcoin token. It's Ethereum, which is less. No. <laughs> I thought I mean, Ethereum is much less. Less, uh, but it's not much less. All right. Listen, you can use other platforms like um, Solano or whatever and do it with a fraction of it. Maybe. Uh, of the energy. Maybe. Yes, you can. I'm so just saying, let's get if Christopher it's exist, Wait, I'm Christopher into Niblet. restaurants. Get my Christopher Niblet this clip. Maybe he should be pivoting to this model. Yes. Okay. Solana NFTs. Because you have a local cafe and you, totally. you do NFT for your local cafe. And you, you, we, you buy the mocha, I buy the cortado. It's one of one. You have 50 different beverages you can buy. You put a nice little image with each one and somebody does that back end for you. You sell it for 500 each. Yeah. Now we've, you sell a thousand of them for your local cafe. They got a half million dollars and you can trade them and it gets you what? You, know, you get first shot at the tables to sit and work in the co-working space? Totally. Perfect. Exactly. You get some kind of benefit. Like I really, yeah. I like the innovation of, an, of a different way to support restaurants. I'm into that. Hey everyone, producer Nick here. I want to tell you about the SaaS syndicate. If you're a founder of a SaaS company with a product and market, our investment team wants to talk to you. Head over to thesyndicate.com slash SaaS, S-A-A-S, to apply to raise from the SaaS syndicate. And you can join Jason's syndicate of over 9,000 accredited investors at thesyndicate.com. Producer Justin here. Know a cool startup? Check out openscouting.com, where anyone can refer a startup to our investment team here at launch. Even if you don't know the founder, if you're the first to flag a company for us and we decide to invest, you'll get 5K in cash or 10% of our carry. Hey everybody, producer Rachel here. Are you an early stage startup that has product and market, some traction, and are looking to raise at least $500,000? Apply today to Remote Demo Day for your chance to pitch to over 9,000 investors in Jason's syndicate. Submit your application at Remote Demo Day Com. Our next event is on April 27th. And if you want to learn how to invest in startups from the world's greatest angel investor, and no, we're not talking about Chris Saka, then head to angel.university to apply. The four-hour workshop costs $300 and all proceeds are donated to charity. To date, we've donated over $175,000 to various charities, and you can see the full list at angel.university slash charity. 